Good morning. I'm Carol Olson Day of the New York Times. Welcome to the 11th Annual Arts and Leisure Weekend. Four days of 15 Times Talks here, live at the Times Center in New York, and live around the world on the web. We're so pleased this morning to have with us the ultimate pack leader, a master at rehabilitating dogs and training humans. His hit television show, Dog Whisperer, is currently in its seventh season across the US on Nat Geo Wild, and it airs in more than 100 countries worldwide. In addition to co-creating and starring in the show, our guest has co-authored six best-selling books, and he will be signing copies of his latest after the discussion. You'll hear much more about him and from him in just a moment, but first, I'm delighted to introduce our moderator. He began writing for the New York Times Magazine 10 years ago. Since that time, he has authored some of the magazine's most read, most discussed, and most emailed cover stories, including, most recently, Can the Bulldog Be Saved? About Breeding Gone Awry. The author of two books, including America Anonymous, Eight Addicts in Search of a Life. He is now at work on a book about dogs, for which he will soon travel around the country in an RV with his eight-year-old lab mix, Casey, telling the story of America through its relationship to man's best friend. Please join me in welcoming Benoit Denise Lewis and our special guest, Caesar Milan. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. Yeah. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, by the way. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, this is Junior. Uh, <laughs> It's funny how a dog on stage just totally changes the dynamic. You know? <laughs> um, thanks uh, for coming and for uh, getting up so early on a Sunday morning. Yeah. I guess they figure that dog people are used to getting up uh, <laughs> really early and letting our dogs out and taking our dogs for walks and generally having our dogs begin another day where they're uh, leading our lives. <laughs> um, and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I'm really uh, glad to be here. I'm glad to have the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> they know how to celebrate, that's for sure. <laughs> I'm glad to have the opportunity to uh, meet and interview uh, Caesar. And you know, if I had known that um, we could have brought our dogs, I would have brought my dog, uh, Casey. <laughs> Although. <laughs> He's happy to be here. <laughs> And um, although I, you know, it's interesting, I, d I doubt that my, my dog's an eight-year-old lab and he acts like he's two and I doubt he would have been sort of the, the model of sort of calm, submissive energy that, that this one is. Um, so uh, before we get started uh, chatting and um, so can you tell us a little bit about, um, I, I know that in season eight you deal with a couple of really interesting dogs. You deal with a dog who's living on an army base who's afraid of people in uniform which sounds like a very, very strange. Right. And then another dog who freaks out when his owners kiss. Um, That's the Valentine episode. Right. Uh, <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit about um, you know, the season and, and what, what we're going to learn that's, that's new and interesting? Well, you know, what, what's, what's funny to me, right? Army means exercise discipline. I mean, that's discipline. You know? And they know the pack, and they know somebody is the pack leader. But they don't practice the same philosophy with the dog. Right. You know, it's no exercise discipline. It's the same affection, affection, affection thing. You know, and, and so the dog became nervous about this, you know, his human in uniform. And pretty much everybody wears uniform in the army face. So he's like, has a, like a nightmare every single day. So is he totally paralyzed, you know, every time he's going outside? And yeah. <laughs> it's like the owner is in Afghanistan. 
you yeah. know, the yeah. owner, the, the, the soldier is in Afghanistan, right? So you have to watch out for that. This dog have to watch out for people with uniforms. Right. It's like, they're gonna attack him, right. you know? But no, everybody wants to pet him, right. you know? And, and that's, that's, he's been living like that for a few years, yeah. you know? And then the, the case where people can have a nice kiss. Right. <laughs> I mean, I love America, right? <laughs> but that's, that's weird. <laughs> you know, you can't kiss your wife. Right. You know, because a dog will come and kill you. Right. <laughs> but is that a, is, I mean, I've seen dogs, I mean, oftentimes I'll, I'll sort of bend down to, I'll be at the dog park, I'll bend down to, to play with another dog that's come up to me, and my dog will sort of come over and sort of want to play too, and sometimes people will assume, oh, your dog is jealous. Um, and uh, you just want to make is sure. My do- is my dog sort of jealous? And it was, it was your sense that the dog was sort of jealous of their? No, it's affection? the responsibility to to make sure the new dog is safe to be with. Right. Because you're acting more from an emotional point of view, and they're always going to make sure it's instinctual point of view. Right. You know, is that dog okay to be with you? Because they don't want you to get hurt. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so that's all it is. But it's the interpretation. You know what I mean? Yeah. My clients, my clients will come from this state of mind. My dog is very intelligent, but he doesn't come when I call him. <laughs> right? My dog is my baby, emotional state, but he wants to kill another dog. <laughs> right? And then the other one is, my dog is my soulmate, but he hates the mailman. <laughs> <laughs> so it's four worlds, instinctual world, intellectual world, emotional world, spiritual world. Uh, my clients come from these three worlds, right? right. Intelligent. You know, I have cli- clients who are Harvard graduate, but they can't walk a chihuahua. Yeah. You see what I mean? Oprah is my client, emotional source. You know, she would call the dogs uh, babies with fur, right? right? right. And then as the spiritual, I did a, an episode with priests and, you know, people who live inside the church, but the dog wanted to kill them. <laughs> <laughs> right? So I got the, four, the three sources. So what I bring to, to the awareness is the instinctual understanding. You know, why dogs in third world country are skinny, but they don't have psychological problems. Right, dogs in America are chunky and they have psychological problems. Right. Yeah. You see what I mean? Right. They seem to have everything in America, but what they don't have is the common sense, the exercise, the discipline, affection. Exercise, discipline, affection does not just address that, it address body, mind, heart. So if you address the body, you gain trust. If you address the mind, you get respect. If you address, you know, after trust and respect, you earn the loyalty. So growing up in Mexico, my grandfather said, never work against Mother Nature. All right, Grandpa, right? Always earn the trust and the respect, but I have to earn it. Right. They're not going to give it to me. I have to earn it, right? And they're going to give you a beautiful gift called loyalty, and that is the off-leash experience. So I grew up my whole entire life walking with dogs off the leash. Then I came to America. I jumped the border, right? <laughs> I run like a Jack Russell, high like a Jack Russell. <laughs> right? Uh, that's my strategy, by the way. <laughs> and I was so determined like a pit bull. And, so, and then I wanted to learn from Americans, you know, how to train dogs. I was watching Last in Rin Tin Tin. So, okay, I gotta learn how this dog talked to Timmy. <laughs> that was editing. You know what I mean? And I, and I have no idea. I didn't have a TV show back then, <laughs> right? And so, so then I observe, you know, um, people in America, when they walk their dogs, <laughs> they were walking this way, you know? And you ask them, what are you doing? I'm walking the dog! <laughs> that was kind of weird to me, you know? That was, that was, I mean, I have to say, you didn't watch the show? I seen Rin Tin Tin. The worst part, not the worst, but the, when I was amazed the most, is when I found this person, grab the leash, with my leash? They do this, they grab the leash, and they do this. <laughs> and then they grab a tree. <laughs> and they go, you can pass now! <laughs> And at the end of the leash is a Pomeranian and two legged. <laughs> after a person with a Rottweiler coming in, you know? <laughs> so that's when I said, look, I'm, I'm not going to train dogs. I'm going to train people. 
so I can rehabilitate dogs. You know, so, so thanks that I live in the street for two months, so I get to observe America. <laughs> you know, you gotta study the place you go, right? So I was, a homeless, I was homeless for two months, you know, after I jumped the water, I live under, under the freeways. I didn't speak any English, so, you know, that's what, that's what happened to me. <laughs> 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 you know, it's like, what are you doing? And, and you talk a lot about, um, you talk often sort of about this fundamental misunderstanding that we humans have about what dogs need and mm. want. Um, and one example that you brought up in Caesar's Way, which I found fascinating, and I've actually been doing some research in myself, is about um, the dogs of homeless people. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I was talking to a, um, someone in Seattle who's uh, uh, who sort of deals with this, and they get a lot of, um, he's an animal uh, control officer, and they get a lot of calls from panicked, um, usually suburban uh, women, who, who um, call and say, you gotta do something about this dog, this dog is living on the street, um, this can't be the right situation for this dog. Um, and, um, and, the, and often the guy will say to them, well actually, you know, these dogs are some of the most well-balanced, mm -hmm. well-behaved, happiest dogs, because they're, always with their owner, and they're always outside, for the right. most part. But well, um, they get to meet America. What's that? They get to they meet get to America. Meet. Yeah. yeah, dogs in Beverly Hills, and they never touch the floor. <laughs> 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 they're inside a bag or inside the car, looking at it, <laughs> and the window. <laughs> right. They don't really get to experience America. You know, a dog that live with a homeless person is experiencing the scent, the sight, the sounds, right. you know, right. how to stay away from people, you right. know. Right. They're, you know I, I mean, they're, like, that's what I was saying about third world country. And if you go to Mexico, we don't have the, the leash law, right? So therefore, people just walk a dog off leash. And the dog can go pretty much anywhere, you know? So the dog get to evolve in, in what, what we call modern society without losing his identity right. or his way of learning. And so when you come into a, a more modern society, a dog has a, a lot of rules, which is another thing that I find a little, um, uh, weird or, or um, unusual, right? Because America is the land of the free, but the dog can walk off leash, right? right? And so at one point, you know, before they called me the dog whisperer, I was called the Mexican guy who can walk a pack of dogs. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's how, you, that's how they identify me, right? Yes, I'm Mexican for sure, absolutely. And, and so here I have 40 dogs walking with me off leash. So here they're following me around. Apparently that was illegal. <laughs> I knew I was illegal, but I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea walking dogs off leash was illegal. This is the land of the free. Dogs get birthday parties and Christmas gifts here. You know what I mean? It's like, what do you mean? Your dog can't walk off leash. You know, so I, that, that was kind of weird to me. Right, right. Yeah. And can you tell us a little bit about Junior? What do you want to know? Uh, just, you know, his bio, <laughs> a little bit about Well, I rescued Junior when, um, the funny part is my friend came and said, you know what, uh, Daddy was 14 years old. Yeah. And, but his mind was very young, you know, Daddy's still his own, his own self. And the guy came to me and said, you know, Daddy's going to die, just like that. Mm. I wanted to smack him, to tell you the <laughs> truth, right? But, but to a certain extent, I know what he was talking about, right? I became emotional. And so, I, and I, 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 saw, I, I know a, what is a litter of puppies, that you can rescue one, right? I said, all right, well, who says no to puppies? <laughs> At least to see them, right? So I brought Daddy, because I don't make you know, my adoption without his agreement. So I went inside with the mother, and I said, well, this one, Daddy's not gonna like him. You know, this one, it's not going to like him. So just to test my evaluation was correct, I brought the more high-level energy dog uh, to Daddy, and Daddy just, <laughs> he didn't like the excitement. Yeah. You know, he didn't thought he was cute. <laughs> <laughs> and he was, he was the pickle of the litter. You know, if you, this is the biggest one, is the most active. <clears throat> and so, okay, fine. And then I brought the weakest one, you know, and Daddy just gave him the back. And then I brought Junior. That's the one I said, that's medium level. It's just like daddy, you know, compatibility. And so, and I, I liked his white paws. It looked just like daddy, but just gray color, right? The different, different color. And so when I brought Junior, 
Daddy went to him, smell him. Junior just lowered the head, <laughs> right? And Daddy just went. <laughs> and as soon as he did that, Daddy turns to the car. Junior starts following him. <laughs> and he said, OK, we got to go. <laughs> and he didn't even say bye to his mom or nothing. <laughs> it's like Daddy knew that we were there to pick up a dog. Yeah. And he said, this one. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so we both agreed. Because that was, that Junior is a medium level energy pit bull. So it's four levels of energy, low, medium, high, very high. Yeah. I didn't pick the high or very high. And I didn't pick the very low. Because right. that wasn't compatible to daddy. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so that's, a, that's one mistake that a lot of people make. They're puppies. Do you guys watch the movie Marley and Me? Yeah. Well, that's a good example of picking the wrong dog. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not everybody gets to have a hit movie, you know what I mean, and an amazing th uh, book. But uh, this dog destroyed their whole entire house, right? And I got to work with John Grogan again, and he did the same mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Human takes a little longer to learn the lesson, you know? <laughs> and uh, do, uh, I mean, the pit bull in this country yeah. is, uh, is the source of a lot of um, concern and controversy. I mean, there's a lot of communities now that ban them completely a lot of, you, know, you can't rent a, an apartment in a lot of places if you have a pit bull. Um, it's interesting, I was reading about this recent study that evaluated the propensity of 4,000 dogs from 33 breeds to bite strangers, turn on their owners, and pick fights with other dogs. Uh, well, the worst offenders was the Chihuahua. Um, <laughs> and you know, pit, pit bulls came uh, in the middle of the pack about the same as poodles. Um, now obviously if a pit bull attacks you, that's a lot scarier than a poodle or mm -hmm. a chihuahua. Um, but I mean, what's your feeling about the, the reputation of this breed and sort of how we've come to understand or misunderstand this breed? I'm just glad they haven't banned Mexicans, you know? <laughs> <laughs> we, have, we, we have bad reputation as well, right? We keep, we keep jumping. <laughs> but we can make a difference, right? Look, in the 70s was the Doberman yeah. that society was afraid of. Right, and then in the 90s was the Rottweiler. So in the, now is the, is the pit bull. So what that tells you is society um, is still maintained his ignorance, you know, or some part of society, and his fear. This is based on fear and ignorance. It's not based on common sense or knowledge. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not the breed, it's the human behind the dog. Petey from the Little Roscoe's was a pit bull, and that's the only dog they ever worked with a pack of kids. <laughs> <laughs> you see it? So it's, it, it, that's why education is so important. Right. You know, we need to make sure that people understand a dog f from this point of view, in my opinion. Animal, a species dog, breed, mm -hmm. then name, right? So when Oprah introduced me, her dog, you know, Oprah's a very influential human being for America. So this is how she did. Caesar, this is Sophie, <laughs> Cocker Spaniel, my daughter. <laughs> See it? Name, breed, humanization. See it? Backwards. Right. And the reason why I'm giving you Oprah is, you know, everybody knows her, and she owns half of the world. <laughs> <laughs> We're probably sitting in her half right now. <laughs> but it's just this, this is the, this, the, the frame of mind of America. America tells you or asks you, what's the dog's name? What breed is he? Is he friendly? Right? Instead boy of. Boy or girl. Boy or girl is also a big one. Right, you boy want or to girl. Categorize them. Right, gender. Yeah, gender. Yeah. But it's like a cat saying, what is it? Why the leers are so long and a basset hound? You know, a cat never asks, you know, what breed is that dog? <laughs> the cat, if a cat is in a dominant state, for example, and you want to bring a dog into the house, the, guy is gonna, the cat is going to go towards that dog. Got close to the dog. <laughs> you know, the cat is not going to ask, wait, 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 what's your name? <laughs> what's wrong with your ears? A bloodhound. You know? <laughs> or your eyes. What's wrong with your eyes? Why well, your eyes are droopy? You know, those, you know animals don't, don't really request uh, of a physical aspect. You know, that's why we love them so much, because they're unconditional, right? 
And, uh, but we're very conditional, you know what I mean? I don't see a dog as a, as a student, I see a dog as a teacher. So we're not really learning their lesson, you know what I mean? We want them to become us, but it's best for them not to become us. Because yeah. we're very conditional species, you know what I mean? So this, this whole segregation of pit bulls are this, and that's good for the fearful world. You know, you sell a lot of magazines that way. You know, and you keep a lot of people attentive to TV. Oh my God, what did he, what did he did? Yeah. You know what I mean? But it's not it's not the dog. I mean, the human needs to take responsibility at one point in life, right? And let's begin with a dog. Right. The greatness of a nation and the model of its values can be measured by the way we treat our animals. You see, that's Gandhi. Yeah. So if we follow that quote, we will create balance. We will create harmony. We will obsolete aggression. Mm -hmm. Aggression is not the problem; it's the outcome of a problem. Aggression is a symptom, you know? But if we think that they, this is the source, that's how ignorant a human can become. Yeah. And is, is it partly for you know, that reason and sort of trying to promote the idea that, that pit bulls aren't dangerous, that you bring a pit bull with you around? Well, it's a Mexican and a pit bull making yeah. a difference in the world. <laughs> 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 right? I mean, it's important that, that we put ourselves up there, you know, as, as, a, as a Mexican man. I'm a human being, right, who's a male, uh, who's a father, um, and who people call the dog whisperer. But, you know, it's, in, in reality, okay, he's Hispanic, right, and that's a pit bull. Right. But what is it that they do? You know, what we do is we create communication between human and dog. So here I have to show you, because humans have to see it to believe it, right? Humans have to see, okay, that pit bull behaves. Right. So it's not all pit bulls. That's the beginning of, okay, right. breaking the myth. Right. You know? right. so, but like I told you, in the 70s was the Doberman. It was, yeah. it was, it was yeah. the breed. One of my favorite movies is called The Doberman Game. Mm. You know, it's back in 1973. This, this five Doberman robbed a bank. Yeah. <laughs> it's not because they want to, the human make them. Really? They could have saved somebody, <laughs> but the human felt that he, they can rob a bank better. <laughs> right? So it's not an option by the dog. It was an option by the trainer. Yeah. But it's amazing because it's a pack of dogs, a very powerful breed, doing, doing an, an activity, doing yeah. something so amazing. Uh, I'm curious. Uh, I, another study that I read, which was really interesting, was uh, done in the Czech Republic. And it, they, they observed over the course of months um, uh, men walking uh, dogs and women um, walking dogs. Um, and they found that, and this was really interesting to me, they found that the, although kind of predictable, that the dogs walked by men were four times more likely to threaten or bite other dogs than a dog walked by a woman. Yeah. And I'm curious if, if your sense is that's because dogs sort of in their sort of masculine macho thing choose a more aggressive dog, or is it some sort of energy that they're projecting um, that the dog picks up on, or is it some sort of combination? I and mean, what's your thought on on that? And is it have you noticed any gender differences in the ways that we? Well, walk, and uh, and then it has to, and then it has to be kind of cultural background then, right. because maybe the male over there are extremely frustrated or something. You know. So you wouldn't project that to, to this country. You know. You no, would, you know. no, no. Here, dogs they're walked by women by more often. Right. Right. You know what I mean? Because first of all, woman is more into relationship than men is. You know what I mean? It's like woman is, in, is more, 80% of my clients are women, yeah. right? And so uh, from a mom point of view, is they got to protect the whole pack. And often the, the, the woman in the house end up walking the dog because the kids are not walking the dog, right. you know, and, and dad comes really tired and that's his excuse. And <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh -huh. And so, so a, a female is going to begin, but often what happens is the way my beautiful clients um, invite the dogs, go, you want to go on a walk? <laughs> right. <laughs> and then it's, hey, come here, come here, come here, come here. You want a cookie? You see it? And so they go and then they put the leash. Sit, 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 sit. Right? Caesar said you better listen to me. 
remember what he said. I'm the pack leader, and they start talking to the dog, you know what I mean? And they go, you're so cute, you're so cute. <laughs> the dog is barely sitting. <laughs> right? And then they go to the next step, which is the door. Stay, stay, stay. <laughs> stay. Remember who the pack leader is. Stay. <laughs> right? And so when the dog goes in front of the human, when the dog goes in front of the human, the dog carries this position of protecting. Right? So you're always going to see, if you see a dog in front, it's going to and then the person's going to feel frustrated, embarrassed. You know what I mean? It's going to, God, he's not listening to me. <laughs> You know, they're going to start telling the dog, we went to dog training classes when you were a puppy. <laughs> and you didn't get it. <laughs> so they, it's a different perspective, you know? Right, Junior? <laughs> <laughs> and um, do you, this, the, the notion of, uh, you know, this is something I struggle with, you know, walking my dog, trying to not let my dog in front of me because I've watched your show. Um, there, <laughs> there, there are other uh, traders who make less of a big deal about the walking in front of and say, right. you know, sometimes your dog's just eager and it's not trying to sort of dominate you. That's but, true. Um, That's true. Um, so just, you know, why the import, why so much importance on that element of, you know, walking out the door, you go first. I mean, does the dog, are you, are you saying that, that a, a dog will, if, if the dog goes out first, that totally changes the whole component of the walk? Yeah. Is that your sense? Yeah. Yeah, but there's a reason why dogs that live with handicapped people don't walk in front of them. They walk slightly in front just to block them from getting hurt, but they're right next to them, right? So I always use handicapped people and homeless people as an example of people who can walk back dogs, or dogs, I'm sorry, who can right. walk dogs, right. right? My clients have flexi leashes and they're tripping everybody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a joke. But. <laughs> But what I'm saying is, what, what I'm saying, uh, a dog that is insecure, for example, will benefit by walking in front. Will benefit, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. he's taking you, he's, you're building security, you're building self-esteem. But if a dog is anxious, if a dog is excited, if a dog is dominant, if a dog is territorial, if a dog has bitten before, he will not benefit from walking in front because you will give him more power. You follow what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, when a, again, when a cat is a dominant one, a dog will never walk in front of the cat. And the cat doesn't use a leash. <laughs> no, no. If the cat wants to go through that door, the dog, the dog will move. Right. But if a human wants to go through the door, the dog will move. <laughs> you see it? Right. And the cat is not saying, move. Please move. <laughs> Please. <laughs> I'm telling you, one, two, two and a half. Three and a half. <laughs> no, the cat just looks at the... And the dog knows he better moves. Right. Right. You know, there's no warnings with the cat. It's just move. <laughs> it, you, you make the point in, in, in your book, Caesar's Way, you say, um, and this was interesting to me, you say, you know, it's not always, it's rare that, you know, it's always the human who's, you know, in charge, or it's rare that the dog is always in charge. It's sometimes in different situations we sort of relinquish our pack leader role and the dog becomes in charge. And I actually feel, and since I have you on stage, I'm gonna talk about my dog for 10 seconds, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, you know, I, you know. Nobody does. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and I give you the example of, so my dog in a lot of ways is, is pretty well um, behaved and in some ways is not. And we go out to the park, he's obsessed with tennis balls. I throw the tennis ball um, and he'll drop it about 10 feet away from me. Um, and then, uh, and this is, you know, since we were a puppy, and, and I'll say, bring the ball, and he'll bring it a little closer, I'll say, bring, and you know, it's sort of laughable at this point, because he's, he's been doing it. And then at the end, in the ultimate sort of display of who are you, he'll nudge it with his nose. <laughs> to me, in, in this sort of dismissive, at least I take it that way. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, it, it, am, I, am I, I'm taking it as he's like, you know, I'm gonna make this human move and pick up the ball. Um, but in a lot of other ways, he's not that way. So my sense is, I mean, am I taking this the right way that he's sort of <laughs> making me move to get the ball? I mean, what's going on there? Somebody have to pick it up, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's patience. It has to do with patience. Right. You know, what is the ultimate goal? From the beginning, they're going to tell you, look, this is as far as I can take the ball, but I don't know if that's ex what you want. So the first day is when you wait, and then he figures it out. Not everybody waits. Oh, I wait, but I mean it. No, but if you, if you say, bring a ball, bring a ball, bring a ball, you're not waiting. Well, sometimes I'll sit down, and we'll just have a stare off for about 10 minutes. Oh, don't look at the ball. <laughs> well, no, I'll look, you know. I'll, right, right, I'll, right. <laughs> for example, look. He'll just rest. So, <laughs> shh. See, it changes the state of mind. Right now, the mind is excited, and he's telling you, what is it that I, what can I do with it? Right. You know, so it's, most of the time, people play with toys just for physical aspects, not for, not for men, see? <laughs> See, or some people feel, oh, because the dog is whining. That is anxiety, right? Because right? he doesn't know what is it that I want. Yeah. Yeah. So I have to give direction to him. You know, how do I want him to be with the ball? Right. So most of the time, <laughs> most, yeah, and people laugh right. Yeah, when the dog is doing that. Because they don't, what, what happens is most of the time people don't understand, so it looks funny. Right. Right? But that gives the dog the, a different understanding of what, what to expect or what to do with it, right? Yeah. <laughs> now what I did is I increased the assertiveness because the anxiety was controlling him. Right. Junior. <laughs> Junior. <laughs> yeah, see it? So here, here, this is good, this is good. Come on. So you have to wait, you know, because the mind, when you ask him to do certain things, it takes a little while for them to calm down. Right. You know what I mean? There is no knowledge behind instincts. It's all reaction. So the brain went from anxiety to excitement. Again, anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. And so what, what most of the people do is, is they gave the ball or they stop giving the direction to the dog. And this is why. We have to control. This is just a dog being anxious, not a pit bull being anxious. Right. So if you let anxiety control a dog who's a pit bull, and then it, it becomes a buildup, and then when they have a, a moment of outlet, they release in this anxiety plus you know the excitement plus the dominance plus the aggression. So it's a lot of layers they're releasing. So here we're not playing. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Very mean. <laughs> The reason why is because he's anxious. So I'm not going to nurture anxiety. Mm -hmm. Because I want, you know, Junior to be as close as Daddy was. <laughs> you know, Daddy's perfect. <laughs> but he was born perfect. <laughs> you know, you're, you're, you're getting there. <laughs> Daddy never whined. You're honest with me, I have to be honest with you. <laughs> you know, that's right. You know, there's a lot, uh, you know, your center in Los Angeles is called the Dog Psychology mm. Center, and, and a, a lot of um, what you talk about is sort of um, communicating and, you know, with your dog and sort of understanding what your dog wants. And I'm curious um, about what your thoughts are about, but, but in a lot of ways, we all communicate with our dogs yeah. in a million different ways. Some yes. of us do it vocally, we do it. With our body language, our dogs are constantly watching us for, for cues. With cookies. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so we're all communicating. And, and, and in ways, we all um, think we know often what our dogs are thinking or what our dogs want. We, and a lot of that, obviously, is projection. But um, I'm curious what you think of you know, animal communicators and pet psychics who claim to sort of actually be able to tell us um, what the dog is thinking and what the dog, I mean, the most common question asked of animal communicators is, is my dog happy? People seem really, and, and I struggle, I want to know, is my dog happy? And that's sort of the most common question asked. And the animal communicator, usually if they're a good one, they're like, of course your dog is happy. <laughs> you know, because they don't want to lose. But uh, I mean, who wants to be told that their dog's not happy? But um, uh, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on sort of the ways that we communicate with animals. Well, I mean, we're searching for, for an answer, right? right. But it's, it's a more tangible way to, if that's the answer you're looking for, um, is 
I would ask my dog, when am I going to get my green papers better? <laughs> you know, the sidekick, when am I going to get my green papers? No, I got, I, got, I, got the green, I got the green card. Yeah. No, no. It's a more tangible way to know if your dog is happy. It's, if he's fulfilled, he's happy. Right. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit, it, uh, dogs are very simple to make, to create happiness. But are we in a lot of denial? I mean, I, we were talking earlier about this. I think sort of it's more guilt driven. Yeah. You know, it's more guilt driven because you know the truth, you haven't walked the dog, you haven't, you know, been disciplined. Right. So you just want to make sure the dog forgives you for that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. But, you know, exercise, discipline, affection, body, mind, heart, trust, respect, loyalty. If, if you practice the principles and the fundamentals, your dog is going to be absolutely content. Right. And tune, happy. It just doesn't take much to, to rescue. You know, one of the new episodes, I'm working with this homeless girl, right? And, and um, you know, I love this story for, the, for this because she's been, off, she's been offered from different institutions to come and join, you know, f to live there, you know, for them to prepare her uh, so she can stay away from the streets and, you know, the whole thing. But none of them will take her with her dog. Right? And she said, look, I'm homeless, not har harmless. I really like that, uh, uh, you know? Because mm. uh, uh, you don't need money to keep a dog. That's what she's saying. What you need is commitment, right? Just to, to prioritize things. You know, when America went into the whole financial crisis and the first, the first thing that went out of, the, out of the house was a dog. I mean, shelters went <laughs> to the roof, yeah. you know? Because people say, well, I don't have any more money to keep my dog happy. It doesn't take much to keep a dog happy. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, it doesn't. It, it's just what makes a dog happy is actually a very simple style of life. That's why they can live with homeless people. Right. That's why they can live with, with uh, what we call handicapped people. I was telling you, you know, uh, the dogs don't see what we interpret as handicapped. Because to me, handicapped people are very in tune to the conversation with a dog. You know, I work with dogs who are mute. With people, I'm sorry, people who are mute. But So that means you don't need verbal communication to have a connection with animal. Because they don't really care about what you say. They care about how you feel. So they're in tune to your feeling. Right. A deeper connection, you know, we often focus more on what we say. What can I say? It's not what you say, it's how you feel. You know, when I came to America, I speak no English, right? But, so I begin by gaining the fundamentals of America. Trust, for them to respect, you know, uh, that I was gonna take care of their dogs, you know? So I charge no money. I walk dogs, you know, that's how, I find, that's how people find me about calling me the Mexican guy who can walk a pack of dogs. I was walking dogs for free, yeah. right? So I gained the trust by, by helping them with somebody they, were, they already love, but they didn't trust them. Yeah. You know, their dogs did not respect them. So I, I make sure I, I fulfill two important things by doing exercise and discipline. That's it, yeah. you know? So, and then the dogs became happy. And then the... Because that reflection is, is towards me, and then the person said, well, I can trust you, right? I can trust you. I went after the fundamentals, and I charged no money, you know? And that from that point, I don't know. Yeah. That from that point on, that's pretty much how I developed this, the foundation in America. So, you know, I don't have a, I didn't have a license. I didn't have all of those things that are important for American people to do business with you, right. Right. you know? So I said, what can I give them uh, so they can trust me, I'm going to walk their dogs. Right. I'm going to make their dogs happy, right? Yeah. And that was it. Simple as that. I wasn't even trying to train the dog. I was and just trying to give a dog happiness. And you said that your father is uh, amazed that, that you get paid to, to walk dogs. <laughs> I know. I go, Dad, I have a job, <laughs> right? And he say, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm walking dogs. Why Americans don't walk their dogs? <laughs> <laughs> they pay me, Dad, $10 per dog. <laughs> You know what I mean? Oh, that's weird. Because <laughs> everybody walks their own dogs. It's not a business, you yeah. know, in Mexico, yeah. especially where I'm from. Now it is. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> and um, can you talk a little bit about the sort of the different um, schools of dog training? One dog trainer said, dog training camps are more like Republicans and Democrats, all agreeing that the job needs to be done, but wildly differing on how to do it. <laughs> um, and um, and and <laughs> which I thought was a nice quote. And you you certainly know you've been criticized for for some of your methods. And there's other uh, dog training methods. Yeah, yeah. Um, talk a little bit about the different kinds of methods and why you 
why you go with the one you have? Well, um, that's actually a, uh, uh, respectfully, I disagree with that comment because it's a misunderstanding of what I teach, okay. right? I, I, I train people. I don't train dogs. Sit down, stay calm, heal. It's training, right? So it's three things. Fundamentals, technique, and outcome. I don't focus on technique. You have different techniques, you know, positive reinforcement and the traditional dog training. And so I focus first on making sure I gain the trust and respect of a dog mm -hmm. before I tell him what to do. You, you follow what I'm saying? So even if you practice positive reinforcement, if you don't pay attention, what is called positive reinforcement, uh, uh, if you don't pay attention to your state of mind, the cookie that you have can actually nurture the wrong state of mind. Mm -hmm. Right? For example, so, hold on, Junior, I'm gonna do this. <laughs> so for example, this is a dog, right, that goes after squirrels, right? But they wanna use positive reinforcement to redirect them. That was a, they considered that a huge problem? That the dog was going after squirrels? Yeah, they're gonna kill the squirrel. <laughs> oh, because my dog never actually gets the squirrel. So I was. <laughs> I know, but I if he crosses the street. Oh, crosses the street. Yeah, it's like for preventing purposes. Right, right. And they can go from a squirrel to a cat, from a cat to right. a, a moose, and whatever you guys have here. <laughs> <laughs> right? So w what happens is if they focus on, on this is gonna change the state of mind of my dog, they're not really paying attention uh, uh, what state of mind are they giving the cookie to, right? Mm -hmm. So they go, leave it, leave it, leave it, right? And the dog is like, <laughs> right? It's, it's nasty. And then the dog looks at them like this. <laughs> they guess he gets the cookie. So they're focusing on the dog not looking. They're not focusing on how the dog is not looking. You follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's a big difference, right? Or they go, look at me, look at me. <laughs> they put the cookie right next to the eyes. <laughs> and then they go, look at me. Look at me, right? So they're focusing on technique. So you're not, they're not longer paying attention how they're asking the dog to, not, to look at them. Right. They're not calm anymore. So calmness is more important than technique, right? So here. Again, so yeah, I'm just gonna show you, you don't have to put the ball right next to your eyes for him to look at you. Watch this, you wait. See, now you got eye contact. Now you got sitting. So this eyes is, con is controlling the brain. Right. So this will be positive reinforcement, right. but without the, the whole talking. So, so that way you keep yourself calm, right? Yeah, see, so you get the eye contact. Junior. Junior, now you have sound. I'm oh, sorry, I gotta stay within the carpet. You got eye contact again. Mm -hmm. So you keep nose and eyes, nose and eyes. 60% of the brain is controlled by the nose. And the eyes control 15%. So you can control the brain just by nose, eyes. Mm -hmm. So that way you stay calm, right? So watch what, stay, stay, Junior, no, leave it, no, leave it. You just start making the dog go like this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to let him have the ball so you can see he's going to go into a, a, an intensity, right? He's going to start foaming and all. That's, yeah. that's limitations. Right. So you're going to see it's up to you to create limits. Right. So he sees the ball as a way of releasing energy, but not a way to get too far into the intensity. Right. The, they start foaming. Yeah. So they practice, so the toy brings that to the brain. So that's not positive anymore. Right. You see what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's a, a, whatever a strategy works for you or you feel comfortable, mm -hmm. that's, it's because it makes you calm or confident. It's not because you agree or disagree, because you don't like it, because right. it makes you angry. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Some people don't like halties. They don't like halties. They say, my dog, my dog, my dog hates halties. Mm. Animals are not capable to hate, right. you know, but that's their interpretation. Right. And, that's, and so what happens when you put a haltie on a dog, he throws himself on the ground, he does all this thing. He's supposed to disagree with something that is un, uh, foreign to him. Yeah. 
Yeah. But people interpret that as hate. Yeah. So now every time the dog sees this, the human puts energy now in it. Right, right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Some people don't like prong colors. And some people can't live without prong colors, right? Because for them, a prong color gives them the ability to control. So it makes them calm. Yeah. So the prong color is not for the dog. So this is pretty much what I, but now I have my own leash, right? But I started with a 25 cents leash, yeah. right? Just a rope. Yeah. And so I put it on the dog. So it's not the, it's not the leash, it's the energy behind the leash that allows you to control. Right. You follow what I mean? And then also, for example here. When you put a leash on a dog, if you put it here, see, right now I'm just blocking the brain from getting into that state, right? right. It's no negotiation, this is just what it is. Right. Right? So that way it's a direct message. Right? A lot of people will go, leave the ball, leave the ball, leave the ball, leave it, leave it, leave it, leave it, leave it. Right. So the more you hesitate, right. Right, the more he holds the ball. Right. You know, and then people start like, competing for the ball. And then, the <laughs> oh, he really loves the ball. Yeah. No. <laughs> right? So if you walk with the leash here, you know, the dog has the option to put his nose in the ground. But if you walk with the leash here, the dog doesn't have the option to put the nose in the ground. Therefore, you control much easier with less physical body. Right. So once you see people with the leash here, you're also going to see them with the leash. Right, right. I'm sorry. Yeah. And often you will see them wrapping the leash around their waist. Yeah. You see it? Yeah, I've done that. The <laughs> neck. <laughs> the, the neck is the most powerful part of the, of the uh, uh, I'm sorry, the, the chest is the most powerful part mm. of the neck. This is the most sensitive part. Right. That's why in dog shows, they keep the leash all the way to the top. Right. So it gives the dog a proud position. Mm. At the same time, the nose is not in the ground. 60% right. of the brain is controlled by the nose. Yeah. So the first thing you have to control is the nose, not the eyes, not the ears is the nose. They're born, with, they're born with the nose open. 15 days later, they open the eyes. 21 days later, they open the ears. Nose, eyes, ears. Yeah. Mother is sent before sight, before sound. Yeah. And so when a human meets a dog, modern human meets a dog, oh my god, they begin with ears. Right, right. <laughs> you see it? And then they start touching the dog, yeah. right? So can, can I share something? Well, I'm sharing, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> All right, so for kids, uh, this is something that I also saw in America. All right. So they see a dog from far away, and the person gets excited. Oh, my God! Can I pet your dog, please? <laughs> right? That's from far away. Right? That's from far away. So remember, proximity is a dog senses or animal senses the energy from far away. So the human begins very polite, right? Please, can I pet the dog? And then the human with the dog, Let's say this, this, this person is going to meet a happy-go-lucky dog, right? So happy-go-lucky dog sees the human that is about to meet him <laughs> 20 feet away, <laughs> right? Now the, uh, the dog lover begins his journey getting closer. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Thank you so The closer you get, <laughs> right, the dog gets more excited. Now, somehow, this dog lover human ends up under the dog. <gasps> oh, my God! 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 <laughs> right? So the dog now is licking the human. <laughs> but this human is interpreting as, kisses, 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 kisses. Right? So now the dog's on the top of the human, right? <laughs> licking the human, and it goes, <laughs> And then the human obviously gets upset, right? And then the owner of the dog gets embarrassed. Oh! Oh! Right? And then, and then the human who was under goes, oh my god, disgusting! And the dog is like, she started it! <laughs> <laughs> this is what I will, I, I, I will always teach, especially kids. Compatibility. You know what compatibility is? Yeah, energy, right? So make sure that you go and evaluate a dog, not based on how he looks like, but what energy he is. 
So low, medium, high, very high. So before you bring this dog into your house, you can think about fostering. If, you know, I suggest to kids that tell the parents to adopt the dog because four to five million dogs die every year in America. So that's one way to help, right? <laughs> right? Then, as soon as you bring the dog home, begin the uh, ritual of teaching them uh, what is called separation, so it doesn't become separation anxiety, right? So when people bring a dog or a, or a, or a puppy, for example, a dog, an older dog, this is what everybody does. Oh my God, he's so cute! That's the first day. Oh my God, and the dog goes start back and back. Oh, he's so cute! Oh my God! Right? <laughs> Sorry, Junior. Or if he's a puppy. Oh my God, he's so cute! <laughs> so now this puppy. It's right here. Oh my God, it's on you. Right? In the top of the human. The first day. The first day. So, so first day, you teach the dog to stay in any place. And you separate. Because in reality, you got to go to school. Your parents have to go to work. And that's the beginning of him learning is staying away from the human. So you begin <laughs> to teach him rules, boundaries, and limitations. And when you come back, you come back with no sound, you enter, you reward calm state. That's just the beginning. <laughs> then you take him for a walk, right? Then you check, how do I feel? I'm calm, I'm confident. Now let's go for a walk. And on that note. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Caesar, thank you so nice much. Nice to meet you, by the it's way. Great to meet you. Good. And, um, He's gone on a journey of four months with his dog. I, yeah. I'm, I'm really jealous about that. <laughs> I mean, Junior and I go to different parts of the world, but not on a RB. We do that one day. <laughs> um, and uh, so you're going to be signing some books, I believe. I think so. I, I think so as well. Um, so thank you, everyone, for coming again. Thank you. Thank you.